like we had all the dance figured out with with the dancers and that this thing happened when we were playing the song on set and like people were like snapping their fingers and bobbing their heads and we we're like yo let's just let's really lean into the little shop of horrors of it all and even the background you know all the background actors that were sitting in the seats like they just like kept bobbing their heads almost like betty boop you know how everyone's like moving to the beat this episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Matt Stosky. How you doing, Matt? Good. Thanks for having me, Alex. Good to meet you. Thank you for ha- thank you for coming on the show, brother. I really appreciate it. You know, I was I get pitched on the show all the time for people to come on, and I heard your story of the DIY beginning of your career just kind of like hustling it out grinding it yeah. doing these crazy music videos to get started and then all the way to uh where you're now where you directed your first feature for a studio uh the blues clues uh spider-man yeah. far from uh far from home or yeah <laughs> no way home version of it which we'll get to. i love the meme treatment oh my god there's people <laughs> The internet is a great place sometimes you know <laughs> you know sometimes sometimes it's a beautiful place sometimes Everyone. Every yeah. once in a while, it's every once in a while. So my yeah. first question, Matt, is how and why in God's green earth did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry? Oh man, I wow, why did I want it? That's that's a question I've I've probably never been asked. Um, I think I I was just I was into it because like a lot of people, I was just making stupid short films with my friends, you know, when we were young, you know, um, running around the woods making horror movies. God, what what was them called? Uh, Hacker Woods was like my first stupid horror movie I made with my friend Mark. Um, and then another reason was because I just had access to equipment. You know, my my high school was a cousin Owen Warren, Michigan, and we had a radio station, TV station, and we would, um, you know, the second half of your day, you know, your fourth, fifth and sixth hour, you just go to the radio station. It was like this rad place where there's like stickers on all the walls and like my teacher had green hair and we just got records from all the record labels. They would send us to all the radio stations first. And we were like a high school station. We weren't even a college station, but we had access to all this rad music. And that's where I learned how to edit by doing like radio dramas. So I did a lot of like audio editing and I learned how to shoot local bands because we would be able to rent out cameras and we would just go shoot bands. So that's kind of how the music video thing started was, was at my local like radio TV station. So I guess that's, yeah, that's the beginning. That's how you got started. And, and, and but I got to imagine that the second you decided to go to be a filmmaker, that all the money came in and you were living large and life was good and it was, everything was easy. You got yeses all the time, right? Oh yeah. The, I, I have to, I'm trying to sell my fifth yacht because, you know, I got to, I got to <laughs> pay for, uh, for the for fourth. Tax reasons. Season, but, for tax reasons. For tax yeah. reasons. I understand. I understand. I too sold my seventh yacht last week. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> tacky to have too many, you know. So. <laughs> it's tacky to have too many. Exactly. Um, but when you got started, man, I, I got to imagine during those early years, there was a lot of rejection and a lot of just mm-hmm. like not. You know, you, you're talking about doing music videos, which I'm assuming a lot were free at the beginning just to get yeah. the reel up. What did you do to keep going when that door just kept getting slammed in your face? Yeah, that was I mean, I think when when you're young, as long as like I had Final Cut Pro and I had my parents computer, you know, and <laughs> my friends and I, we threw our money together. I mean, yeah, we borrowed gear from the school, you know, to, to shoot stuff. But we also bought like VX 1000s and VX 2000s, like those skate video cameras. Mm -hmm. And as long as we had a camera and editing gear, we were able to, you know, I mean, yeah, the band and the label would be like, hey, we got 500 bucks for a music video. I'm like, cool, that's the gas to get to New York, you know. And that happened multiple times. But like, you know, at the time, like, I don't know, everything was cheaper. We were all, I mean, in high school, we're living at home, so we don't have any bills to pay. But when I got to college, you know, we were able to really stretch a dollar, you know, so we would shoot tons of stuff on like $500, $1,000 budgets. I remember we got like our $7,000 budget and our mind was blown um, for this video for this band called Evergreen Terrace. They're like this hardcore band from Florida. I'm still good friends with Josh James, who's in that band. Um, he's actually getting into videography now and I'm kind of helping him with that. But uh, but we got 7000 bucks to shoot that in Detroit and we used all the money to get like a real Chapman dolly and like 16 millimeter, you know, camera, good lenses, some real lights. And it was me and like two other guys 
and a makeup person and we hauled it all up to the roof to this rooftop like 10 stores like literally at chapman dolly a chapman had, like, dolly 10 yeah stores? we had we had like no no pas or grips or electricians or anything we just did it all ourselves and so it was um it was a lot like up until the point where i was like actually doing music videos for record labels i was still like wrapping up all the cords and putting all the lights away you know like everything you could do on a non-union shoot we were just used to it you know so we had tons of situations where even though we were we we you know you write a lot of treatments and you get rejected a lot but those treatments those times we did get the opportunities even if the label had 500 bucks you know like we just had to be creative you know we just had to learn how to shop in a fabric district and learn how to go to a party supply store and get confetti poppers, you know, and just like weird things to add production value to a video when you can't build sets and, and, and really like, you know, the city of Detroit, like just scout the city and find the cool alleys to shoot in and find the picturesque areas and shoot when the lighting's good and all that stuff that, you know, the guerrilla filmmaking stuff, you just kind of learn it on the fly, you know, I'll, I'll blow your mind. Cause I'm a, I'm a bit older than you. So in the nineties, yeah. In the 90s, I remember working on $300,000 budget music videos yeah. low, with, right? with which was low and yeah. third, third string artist. Not even yeah. the top. That's not that's not top level. That's not yeah. the Taylor Swift of their day. It was yeah. third string. They were the backup singers of the real people who the label was trying to get out. I remember yeah. specifically. And yeah. I'm like, three, two, seriously, there was so much money. Yeah. That's in Miami, no less. In Miami, not yeah, even yeah. in New York or LA. In Miami, yeah, where where you don't have access to like multiple rental houses and stuff. And <laughs> that was, I mean, I would, I, I think that was the biggest budget I ever. I mean, I did a commercial that was bigger, but music video wise, like the Disney videos, videos I did, like the kid videos, those were that was the budget, and that was considered big. Like we're like, whoa, we could shoot two days instead of one, you know. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, I, I yeah, I got into the game right when I was just doing this. But a lot of the you know, I, I heard a lot of stories from, you know, a lot of ADs and and, uh, and electricians I worked with, of, you know, being on the set, like the Michael Jackson set where he didn't show up and it was a four day shoot and everyone got paid full rates and they just sat sure. around that, you know, kind of a thing. And oh, glory, yeah. you know, so <laughs> it's I just got, so much money. It's so much yeah. money was coming on, man. It was insane. Well, yeah. I mean, also, to be fair, I mean, everyone was still selling, you know, twenty dollar CDs yeah. back then. Yeah, you yeah, know, there wasn't. It, it was a whole other different business model back then. And now um, my have the checks where you get five cents, you know, residuals on Spotify and stuff, you know, so <laughs> like it costs Somebody more to send, it costs more to send the check than the check is worth. Yeah. Yeah. So weird. just send so me weird. a stamp, send me a yeah. free stamp. Would you do that? Yeah. That'd be better, more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you were, so you did a bunch of stuff like, you know, like, and I did a bunch of that stuff too coming up as well, like doing these commercials and, and stuff like that. I wasn't getting paid, but when you first had a real client mm -hmm. and it was a big budget, mm -hmm. when you walked on set, you had a real crew. Yeah. You know, and that was, you're not wrapping cable anymore. Yeah. yeah. What did that feel like? Like when you were on the first time you were on a hundred thousand dollar plus budget, you're mm -hmm. like, Oh God, this is real. Like there's yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. pressure. How did you deal with that? How did you feel on that day? Yeah. You know, I can remember it too. I, it was, it was like a fallout boy video in 2008 that I did. And, uh, and that one was, I think like Pete Wentz was dating Ashley Simpson. And I remember <laughs> there was like paparazzi on set and like, you know, people doing a bat. Like, I think she had a reality TV show that was filming. <laughs> there was like all these cameras and like, I don't know, you know, there was the MTV people and the VH1 people and then our cameras. And so it was, it was intimidating, but, but I, I do remember like Pete Wentz had my back, you know, he, he saw, I did this Anthony green video that was really trippy with lots of animation. And that's the reason I was able to do fallout boy, because he, he vouched for me. He's like, I want that. I want that weird trippy animation style. And so, you know, when the artist kind of, you know, has your back like that, all it takes is to sort of get a couple shots in the can and show the band, you know, and like show them what it's going to look like. And when they, sort of like how it looks you just get that confidence boost and then like the artist is gonna they act a little wackier on set you know and then they you know kind of give it their all and everyone sort of trusts you so it's just um i think i think early on though in that stage that i'm not gonna say fake it till you make it but that sensibility does make sense like you may feel like you you know there's some imposter syndrome for sure mm. but the, the the i think the main thing about directing that that I've realized like 
in the last, I mean, I don't know, pretty recently, maybe in the last five years is you just have to be the person in the room that knows the most about the thing you're doing. You know, if you're going to, you know, make a music video about whatever Detroit, you just got to do your history and be able to tell all the executives, all the, you know, record label people, all the artists like, yo, Detroit, this, this, and this, these spots are great. This is awesome. You know, you just have to, you know, do your research and know the most, you know, kind of a thing. So with music videos, it was all about pre-production, just having insane storyboards and references and film clips and all this stuff. So when you're on set, you're showing the artist all this stuff, you know, I guess we didn't have iPads back then, but just flipping through like your laptop computer and just showing the record label, like, okay, this guy knows he's, he's got a vision and uh, he thought about this a lot. You know, I, I, I hate ad living. I think I have nightmares about <laughs> like coming up with shots on the spot, you know? So yes, it's intimidating, but if you just like have tons of references with you and like really tell all your department heads exactly what you're going for, then it's, then that confidence kind of, you know, swells inside you. So. It's funny though, th- like literally last week, uh, my daughters uh, were listening to a song Mm-hmm. And they're like, what's this song? And 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 there's like, and I'm like, that's that's CeeLo Green. And, yeah. and it's just like, I'm like, I, it's like, can we see the video? I'm like, I've never actually seen the video of this, oh. this video. So I literally watched the CeeLo Green video, forget nice. you, like nice. four, four or five days ago. Oh, with, nice. Not knowing that you directed it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Not knowing that you directed it. I just, it just, it was a happenstance. The yeah. universe just brought that to so now it's like it's fresh in my mind. I just saw it like literally four days ago. And then I'm as I'm doing research on you, I'm like, son of a he directed the CeeLo Green video. Yeah. Was was that CeeLo Green? Because that was such a massive hit for CeeLo yeah, yeah. Green. I mean, so massive. Was that the thing that just took your career to another level? It was for sure. I mean, that that's the thing that got me representation. It got me an agent and a manager, <laughs> you know, that's um, you know, Eric Garfinkel and uh, Britton Rizzio, and and they're the ones that taught me the, the 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 narrative industry, the film industry, and got me reading scripts and all that. So that that video was a big a big help for me for sure. And and we didn't, you know, it was the whole story behind that's really interesting because I was working at um, Refuse TV, which is you know this woman Kathy Pello runs it. She also has a record label called Sergeant House, and she's this like incredible just punk rock woman that knows everyone. She's like, knows the New York party scene. And she hung around with all these, I think she was a a model back in the day. And she hung around with all these legends and she knew people in the theater and the Broadway world. And uh, she was a commissioner for Atlantic records as well. So when that track was, was kind of sent out, the song was called fuck you. And Mm -hmm. a lot of big name directors passed on it. Like I, I, don't quote me, but I think like Mark Romanek and Spike Jones and Chris Cunningham, like all passed oh, on it. Like, all sure. these, they were trying to go that artsy route, you know? And, uh, and she was like, well, we got like a 60 K budget and we got to do this in one day. And so I got to like write on it. And I just wrote that like Motown doo wop treatment and he loved it. So, you know, <laughs> enter, enter 16 hour day, you know, try to shoot this thing at Cadillac Jacks up in the Valley. And, uh, and that's what like kicked it all off. So it was a really good, like, I have to thank Kathy Pello for that because, you know, a lot of people, I don't know, everyone's break is always a weird story like that. Like it was right place at right time, you know, kind of a thing because uh, she happened to be the commissioner for that rec- for that uh, video. And a lot of people happened to pass on it just because the song was obscene, you know, the, the title. At the was- time, until they did Forget You, which they said, yeah. hey, we, we need some radio play, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it just, it had that viral thing because it was like an obscene title. But it was such a happy going doo wop right. so, right. like, like, you know, it it sort of, you know, made F you this popular meme viral thing, you know, so it's it's I always thought that was kind of fun how that 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 whole thing happened. It was it was a quite the quite the interesting. It was year. it was what year was that? Was that I mean, it was a 2010 10 or 11. So the, yeah. Exactly. Because it still had a vibe. Because mm-hmm. I remember the the '90s when you had the the McGs of the world and the Michael Bays of the world, where they're using the cross processing and it really yeah. vibrant colors. Yeah. You had really vibrant colors in that. Yeah. I remember it wasn't gone like a McG Smash Mouth video was <laughs> back yeah, yeah. in the day, but it looked beautiful. And then you mixed in this whole like musical aspect to it, which was like. Which is which was the sign of like where you're going because this is what you yeah. love musicals and we'll talk about the musical side of you in a minute, but it yeah. was really, it, it didn't look complex in the sense of the budget. It wasn't it was one location essentially. A few, mm-hmm. It wasn't that crazy, 
but it wasn't it wasn't an expensive budget. It wasn't it was you did a lot with the money you had. It made yeah. it look really good out of one location, basically one big location or one small yeah. location. <laughs> yeah, and and we just like it was one of those things where you just use the look you use the advantage of that location, the neon lights and the colorful walls, and we just like saturated all the lights. And and there was also something that happened too. Like that was the first job I ever did with Lindsay and Craig, my choreographers, and they they did the blues movie too, um, and every music video in between. And uh, we we sort of like we had all the dance figured out with with the dancers. And that this thing happened when we were playing the song on set and like people were like snapping their fingers and bobbing their heads and we we're like, yo, let's just, let's really lean into the little shop of horrors of it all. And even the background, you know, all the background actors that were sitting in the seats, like they just like kept bobbing their heads, almost like Betty Boop, you know, how everyone's like moving to the beat. And that just added this like kind of funny, nostalgic touch to the whole thing. And I think everyone just loosened up and all the, you know, all the, people that were playing all the roles in the film and the different silos like were just real loose and i think people were just vibing because it was a good song you know you don't always get like a good song to, to <laughs> write sometimes you have to do you know i've done every kind of video but that was just a great song and everybody loved it so everyone was just bobbing their head the whole time and it just we captured that energy you know and how did the town treat you after that after that video um bell of the ball yeah. i i booked i booked a good you know i kind of stepped up as far as music videos go um you know, and, and I was able to book a lot of, of jobs and I was really riding that momentum. I think if I could go back in time, you know, I mean, I guess I, 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 I would, I can't say I'd like change anything about my life, but I probably would try to use that momentum to push myself more towards narrative earlier, you know, because I, you know, I'm 37 now and, and uh, I probably could have gotten into nar the narrative world a little bit earlier, but I just, I just kept booking music videos for years. And that's kind of why. I stalled on the narrative thing because I was just working and it like, I, I, yeah, exactly. And, and even you, got five, my, you got five yachts, brother. You got to, I mean, that's a yeah. lot to support. Yeah. Yeah. And after the second yacht, I just had to keep doing the music videos because the budget got nothing. <laughs> um, by yachts, I'm talking like the paper ones you fold up, you know, and you put, obviously, yeah, obviously, yeah. sir. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I was, I was booking some work after that and, and it was cool. You know, it, it, it's a good feeling to do like eight music videos a year. I mean, I know some people like turn out 20 a year, but, with all the post effects that I do, you know, I always was like editing my own stuff. So eight was like keeping me really busy. And, uh, and yeah, I was really busy after that for sure. That's awesome, man. Now uh, we all, as directors, there's always that day on set, um, that the entire world's coming crashing down around you and you don't think yeah. you're going to make it, you're not going to make it. And then, and arguably that's every day, but yeah. there's generally that one event that really stands out out of a project if you don't want to say the project, you don't have to say the project, but if it's a project, you could say, say it. And what was that event and how did you overcome it as a director? Um, I have to say that's, that's only happened. I mean, yeah, we have tough days and yeah, we have to like, you know, kill setups and, and weather happens and things like that. Um, but like the, the toughest day, it was this video I did uh, for me, for Neo, uh, the um, friend like me, uh, it's a, it was a Disney video. He was doing a cover of the Aladdin song and it was just one of those days where the the setup for everything, we just didn't have enough money and enough people to light this location. And there was this big pool in the middle of our location and it was so hard to move the camera around there. And I really tried to like, I mean, we, we at the end of the day, we pulled it off, but it was one of those days where we really ran out of time and I had to like kill half the shots, like literally half the shots. Um, but, uh, but they were the narrative shots in... And something, I mean, this is this is an interesting thing that happened, and this legitimately happened. We shot we shot Neo against a wall for the performance stuff. You know, lit him pretty, just put like a, a, a blue color on the wall and lit him all orange. And we shot a wide medium close up, and that was like the performance coverage. He's an incredible performer, so it was like we had great stuff, and all that footage got corrupted in you know <laughs> the cards or whatever. So yep. the, the insurance for the production actually covered us. They have another day of shooting. So we were able to get him on the stage and light him even better and get even better performances out of him. And no one was stressed out. So all that time that we didn't, you know, all the shots that we didn't get, we were able to get on the second day because a, a card was corrupted and insurance actually covers that somehow. You know, I don't, I don't know how that all works, but we got another day. So that was the most, like, that was one of the days where I realized like, 
wow, we're not going to get it, you know? And uh, the video looks cool. You know, his performance was incredible. It's all about him. So, but I, I've never had, I mean, I've heard those stories, you know, from, you know, some, some more like seasoned, you know, guys and gals that I've worked with of, you know, the hurricane comes through and blows the, you know, the, the flags <laughs> over and the, he stands flying and somebody got injured and there's like, you know, like, you know, it, people suing people and all that. Like I've heard of that, you know, before um, I've never had like a nightmare day like that. And I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe it's, it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of just being prepared kind of a thing, you know, but. Well, listen, when I was putting my demo reel together, I shot 35 and I sent it up to uh do art. Cause I'll say it out loud uh, okay. in New York. And uh, they, uh, the machine broke and burned out all my neck. For oh two my of God. my spots, for two of my, out of the three spots I did, two of my spots gone. gone. That was 20, 25 grand out of my pocket. Mm. Gone. And they're like, we'll do the new rolls again for free. I'm like, oh, really? And I was yeah. so young. I could have sued them. I should have done. I mean, I yeah. could have, got, I should have easily gotten because come on. So yeah. I had to go back and and that's why my demo reel cost 50 grand, but I, I lost my, and I was better. Actually, I got back. I got a better set of DPs. I, I did it. it. Same thing as yeah. you got to do it again figured things out differently. It was an expensive lesson, but it was a lesson nevertheless. Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I can remember back times like heart, like, like hard drives have gone corrupted and things like that. It's, oh, yeah. it, it, it turned it's our, brutal. like whether my generation, your generation, we've turned into like command save people. Like I'm always hitting command save, command oh, save, yeah. making double backups and triple backups and like sending a hard drive to my parents. Just so I know in Michigan, there's a hard drive with the thing in case my house burns down, you know? So it's uh, <laughs> when that happens, you turn into a worry work for sure. Yeah. And no, it's in, I came up with when the first avids were coming up and those things crashed mm -hmm. all the time. So I became an apple safe, apple safe, apple safe, apple safe, yeah. apple safe, apple safe, constantly. It's yeah. a, it's a habit. Now I'm used to the new stuff that just kind of saves in the background constantly yeah. for you. <laughs> and, it's loud and everything. It's, it's a whole different thing. So, but, oh my God, I still have all those hard drives too. They just like, I, every time I, I do big creative stuff and it's like, I don't even think the, the power outlets work anymore, you know, like, but I don't know. It's, I, have, you know so I, I just, I just moved from LA to Austin last uh, a year ago. And I did that. I had a box of firewire 400. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I, and I, they all worked, they all revved up and oh. I just downloaded them all into a, a solid state drive and just started dumping them. Like, I don't need this. I don't need that. And then just put nice drills in the holes. Yeah. <laughs> I just recycled them. <laughs> Yeah. I threw away all my film recently. My like I had like some sixteen, some thirty-five. From, I can't uh, get rid of mine. Dudes, and I can't get rid of mine. Yeah. I, I have it in my closet right now. I can't get yeah. rid of my thirty-five. I got thirty-five, sixteen, super eight. And yeah. I can't get buckets of them. Buckets of these yeah. thirty-five. You need to get a prop someday. You need it to like, you know, well, you know the you know. other day, the other day I, I I actually I just retransferred them all to four K or to six K yeah. actually, because I did everything to standard def before. Cause I was like, you know what, let me go back and take a look at some of that stuff. And yeah. I did, I transferred. So, but eventually I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to let it go. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> because, because, you know, our mansions don't have the space for them anymore, you know? You Obviously. Know. Yeah. I mean, we have to get, yeah. I'll send it out to my West Palm beach mansion. Yeah. yeah. That'll be the film. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing a lot of people don't talk about um, as first filmmakers don't understand is the politics of a set mm -hmm. and music. I, I, I came up, uh, later in my life, I, I was I, I joined uh, a music video crew, and I did mm -hmm. a lot of big music videos in the post side, and yeah, I was yeah. on set, and you know, with Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, you know, yeah. Ludacris, all these kind of people, are coming up, mm -hmm. and um, I saw the insanity. Yeah, uh, it's insane, like in, insane, uh, on set with a music video set. Mm -hmm. But when you started getting onto these other sets that weren't, they were more professional, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and you had these older crew members who saw mm -hmm. this kid. Mm -hmm. I gotta imagine you got some pushback. Yeah. How did you deal? How did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I my my personality is I I'm very passive. You know, I'm 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 I can say I'm if I'm if I'm confrontational, it's as kind as I can possibly be. I know. I mean, I had to. I always knew I was the young guy on the set, you know, and I think anyone's going to deal with that if, if you're directing, because, you know, you're always going to get crew guys that are, you know, a little, little older than you. Um, but, 
you know, I, I can't think there's ever been any like conflict. Like I know there were probably people, I mean, obviously we've had like our 18 hour days where you're sure. pushing people too hard and stuff. And I learned from really good producers not to do that very early on because someone gets in an accident on the way home. That's, you know, um, right. so you know, I only had, I had a very short lived career as far as pushing people too hard and having long days. And I, I luckily I'm, I worked with some really good, like I worked with um, this guy, Mark Russell, uh, chef is his nickname. I don't know if you ever ran, he was, he's an incredible AD and uh, he was big in the music video scene. Like he worked with hype Williams and uh, Mark. Oh, back up. Cool. Yeah. He was like hype's guy for a while. And uh, when I got to that like budget range where I could afford him, you know, he was my AD and he had my back and he was one of the, you know, like the best ADs are the ones that can like, you know, kind of yell and get everyone to listen to him, but like kill you with kindness at the same time, you know, like compliment right. that. Like when it's time to like get the shot, like let's go. He's that guy. And he, he sort of taught me a lot that I know. And he always had my back on set. And I think that helped a lot with those situations because he was a veteran. And so just like the directing department being, sort of like supportive like that like he was able to push back at any of that you know like any kind of smirks or anything that came from some of the older people on set and um and i also you know like if you can remember someone's name and shake their hand and look them in the eye and and compliment them if some light you know if some lighting looks incredible it's not just the dp it's the gaffer you know it's like so many, it, it takes a village every time and and uh, as long as you you know really make sure everyone sees that their craft is is seen and respected and that they're doing a good job. I think that that's like the key, you know, to, to, to sort of getting that respect, even being younger. But um, I don't know if, if there was anyone that was a little bit better just cause I was young, like whatever, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm too focused on this insane day right. where there's so many shots you got to get and you have this amount of time and, the clients like looking over your shoulder, like there's too much other stuff to worry about, you know? So. Gotcha. Yeah. Some, I mean, if, if you have a good, if you have a good first AD uh, to, to, or D, a good DP too, to kind of, yeah, to help yeah. you with that stuff, that's helpful. But sometimes yeah. you, I, I mean, I had guys who literally just like literally try to under, try to chop my legs off underneath from underneath me yeah. while on set. So it's a different, yeah. certain things you just have to figure out. I mean, at one point I, some, someone I walked on set and thought that I thought it was a PA. <laughs> yeah, yeah like the, yeah. <laughs> the upm hadn't met me yet and they're like all right you uh go go get the yeah. craft service going i'm like dude i'm the director <laughs> yeah that, that's happened to me recently actually because like i i had a couple um like like our second ad was like like because i just <laughs> wore a black t-shirt and jeans because i'm there to work you know i'll be on my knees like and i'll and i'll get my hands dirty and i'll you know it's like He's like, normally the directors I, I work with, like, show up, like, with a suit and a tie and makeup and their crazy hair and all this. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm just, like, here to work. You know, it's it's the same mentality. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if, if you're sitting, like, and I also, like, don't like to sit. Like, I'm always trying to stand because that was, like, in music video world, it was, like, you see a shot and you're going to run over and talk to somebody. And then, like, you just can't be on your on your butt, you know. I, I, I haven't had that luxury yet, you know. So maybe in a commercial I sat because that's, like, the bottle. Oh, yeah. You know? It's all about like four hours on lighting the freaking bottle. I mean, yeah, and, yeah. and the clients, they're like, and you're like, oh, just do, God. just do, yeah. just do, let me know when you want me to yell action. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah not, but when you got like a million setups in, you know, no time to do it, like you're just, you're running. And I think as long as, I mean, and a lot of people see that too. They see how physical the job can be too. So it's like, maybe oh. you get a respect from that too, you know? So. That's true. That that is true, though. If if this crew sees you bust an ass, yeah. They but if you're sitting on a on a recliner with your coffee latte, yeah, you know, yeah. in in their butt, and they're like, "Hey guys, I need you to lift that crane up ten stories. I'll meet you up there." Not yeah, that you yeah. need to do it, but they just need to see that you're. It's yeah. a, it, you're you're a general man. You're a general yeah. running a, running a unit, and yeah. and they got to see you moving, and they got to see that you're into it. But if yeah. if, if if there's pretension. Oh man, it's yeah. hard. You yeah. lose, you lose your crew. You lose everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's like, that was a big part of it. Too. Like I never like, I was never like posing for photos or like, you know, like, Oh yeah. yeah you know, yeah. doing the whole, yeah. the whole thing. Like, look at this set we built, you know, like, you know, like, like now nah, you just like, you get a shot, you go, you talk to the actors or the artists first, then you talk to your DP, then you talk to your AD and then you, you know, you make sure they know what to communicate to their team. And, and you just you just go in order and and whenever the you know the record labels talking to you everyone else needs to like 
you know, they're first obviously, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just making sure if you communicate good, I think you get that respect. Like if you're very clear and there's no like question marks or people like confused as to what they're doing, you know, right. and, and even if people say you make, if they see you make decisions, like, you know what, we're running out of time. We got to cut this shot. Like if you do stuff like that too, they're like, okay, he, he's not going to like run us into the ground. Like we're going to get through the day, you know? So, um, it, yeah. It, yeah. So if there was a thing, man, if you can go back in time and tell your younger self at the beginning of this journey, one thing, what would that one thing be? It would be shoot a short film way earlier because <laughs> my, my, my agent and manager were like, were always telling me shoot a short film, do a short film, you know, you need narrative. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I was, I don't know. I think I, I wasn't like cocky when I was younger, but I definitely was like, I can just go straight from music videos to features, you know, like Fincher that's what, did it. Fincher did it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, my first short film I did was like, you know, with, with that looked good. was like 2016, 2017. And I should have done that way earlier because, um, and, and just like learning narrative, you know, like, I think, you know, I, I learned a great deal in school. I actually really like college. Um, but, uh, you learn the most from just watching movies, just putting on the criterion channel and watching old shit, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and that's, and that's sort of the best film school. So I think, I mean, I, I do like to watch a lot now and I did watch a lot in college and stuff, but I think I would have, I mean, I have friends that, you know, 400, they watch 400 movies a year, you know, it's like, like every night they watch a new movie. Um, and I think that's the best because that, the influences from all those films is going to like consciously or subconsciously make its way into your film. And I think taking, taking your references and style from old stuff is the best way to go. Cause if you take it from new stuff, it's obvious. It's like, Oh, they're ripping off euphoria. Oh, they're ripping off, you know, you know, whatever new, you know, Tarantino movie or whatever. But if you take for, well, Tarantino takes from all the old. So that's like, a, <laughs> that's a big circle. It's but, a vicious, um, it's a vicious circle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, no, you're yeah. absolutely you're absolutely right. That's why, like, you know, P.T. Anderson stole a shot from Boogie Nights from um, I Am Cuba that no yeah. one had ever heard of unless you had a Criterion laser disc of it. Yeah. Or your yeah. Martin Scorsese, your Francis for Coppola, who produced it or released it. Yeah. And everyone was like, this shot's amazing. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's from I Am Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's it was such a great shot. And it's so I, beautiful. You know, I saw that for the first time just recently because I'd never heard of it. And I Am I, Cuba? And yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, it's oh. just like I saw that that one shot, and I was just like, "What is this?" Like, it just how it, how it, did they do it? Oh, and yeah, no, no. And the thing that they did was how they did the stuff. We're talking about nineteen fifties, yeah. Technology, these yeah. tank of thirty five millimeter cameras. I mean, yeah. tanks weighing a ton, yeah. and they're flying them around like they're like an iPhone on a gimbal. Like it's. Yeah. Ma I mean, just insane. And then from the ceiling, from a rooftop, down an elevator, walking yeah. around into the water, like mind blowing, it's, mind yeah. blowing. And, and that's why that's why the whole practical way is always the best. Like and I think people even people that swear by CGI, you know, I've seen mm -hmm. good CGI for sure. And I, I like certain amounts, but you subconsciously know it's not real, you know, but when you put that real practical thing there or the camera really you know, like what Inneratu does and what they did in, um, um, what's the, Top Gun. Uh, <laughs> Top Gun. Oh yeah. Even Top Gun. Yeah. I saw that three times in the theater. Cause I was just like, I know this is really happening. And, my mind and can you and, imagine if that would have been CG? Can you imagine if that was, yeah, it, it, would just, it wouldn't have made the money. It wouldn't, people yeah. would be like, no, great. Yeah. And that's a really good example of something that everyone's going to hear before they see that, that it was all real, you know? So if there's like a good, I think, I think films should definitely have campaigns behind them if they do pull off crazy practical things, you know, like, like even, um, what was that film that came out, uh, Victoria, the one shot mm -hmm. was it a film, you know, um, they said like, yes, this actually is a one shot film. It's not like a Hitchcock foreground pass that we're doing. Like we shot this, I think they did it three times. And the second time was the one they used or something like that, but that was a full, they started at, 2 a.m. and or 3 a.m. and the film ended at 5 a.m. and it's an actual one shot thing and I don't care who you are if you know that information before you see the film it's going to make the experience that like when the guy plays the piano or he catches the thing or they have the squibs and the guy gets shot like you just know like wow this was all planned out you know and it's That's just it, like it, it, yeah it's another experience it's like seeing the the 18 wheeler flip in Dark Knight you're just yeah. like yep 
and you could tell that's real. Like that's yeah. there's no C you can't CGI the way it looks. The yeah. the motion, the things that click, it's just too complicated yeah. for it to look it, real the way it is. Yeah. Did they did they do a Jackie Chan on that and show the cre- show it multiple times? I can't remember if it was like a Oh, two. you mean like when I I'm sure they did. I'm sure the edit was like that, but it it once it left, it it was yeah. there and then I think they probably cheated a little bit as far as just the edits, but yeah. that thing was and then I think boom, boom, boom. Like they they probably yeah. crammed it down like three times, like the, the Jackie Chan you, style. But you it's think still the, real. Yeah, you think in the edit they were like, oh my god, we have eighteen incredible angles of this, but we can only show like three, you know, like because it's <laughs> they probably had so many. I I also heard. I mean, I can't remember this, but I thought I saw a viral video where they, did they shoot that during the day and they just colored it to be night? I, I, no, I, I think that was night. Not, I, at night. least the behind the scenes. At least the behind the scenes that I saw was night. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, that would be too difficult, man. No, you can't yeah, do shit. Be, day, day for night is tough yeah. in general. Like, yeah. but to do something like that with the light, no, man. I, it, maybe it's because like I remember seeing somebody filming it from their apartment and it just looked like daytime, you know. Well, but, maybe it was the prep or I don't know because they had to, yeah. you know, it wasn't. A, I don't think it was a one or I think they, I think they could do it more than once. But who knows? Yeah. But they now we're t- getting it. Now I, we're getting into some geeky film stuff. Now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, when two filmmakers get together, we start going down that road. Yeah, yeah. I am Cuba turns into D- D- Chris yeah. Nolan real quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so your your feature film debut uh, is the new film Blues Big City Adventure. Yes. How did the guy who directed Fuck You <laughs> get the Blues Clues? You know, you, you know, a big Paramount release. You know, how did that happen? How did you get involved in this movie, man? I have to say it's 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 I I, I worked with Brian Robbins back in 2013. Brian Robbins oh, yeah. is sure he's now head of Paramount, you know, was head of Nickelodeon, had Austin as TV. He when when he was at Austin as TV, I did like a sort of team musical thing with him called Side Effects. And I just stayed in touch with him over the years. He then eventually got me like an Aquafina commercial. Um, and then I did like a pilot for Nickelodeon with him and I think the the script was kind of sitting around for a while with Blue's Clues, you know, like they had always wanted to do it. And the timing was right because, you know, Steve went viral last year. And as far as the co-viewing ship, a lot of the adults that grew up with Steve now have kids that are growing up with Josh. So I think from a just per, like promote, like a free promotion standpoint, like, a, like if the parents are going to watch it, the kids are going to watch it, the kids are going to watch it, you know, it just, it worked out. The timing worked out. And Brian just called me and he was like, Hey man, like we got this thing and it's a musical. And I was kind of in that musical because he gave me a lot of creative freedom. Um, like, obviously I don't forever want to be in the kid's space. I don't want to be in the preschool space, but I want to show like, Hey, I can take something with a, you know, like an indie budget and stretch every dollar and make it look like three to four times more than what we really had. Cause that's what we had to do in the music video world. And, you know, fingers crossed. I hope like, like I know that, like our movie's coming up the same day as Disenchanted, you know, the big Disney tent pole, whatever, you know, they probably had a hundred million bucks on that. And if we compete in the smallest degree with that on streaming, like to the smallest degree, if we put a dent in that, then that's cool because we did have, you know, yeah, it was, it was uh, like an indie budget, but it was still a lot of the ways and the techniques we used were, you know, rag tag DIY ways of, of doing things. And, and so I was, I was kind of like, I, I liked the challenge of it. I knew the brand was important and existed. And I just had this, this, you know, the fact that I was going to be able to make colorful, beautiful musicals and with the musical genre, it's fantasy. So you can break so many rules into where you're going to do a lot of fun stuff as far as the fantasy of it all. Um, I was, I was game. And also like, I'm not rich, so I'm going to take every job I can get. So <laughs> you know, like literally that's part of it too. Like I, I was, I've never been able to pick and choose my jobs, you know? So it was on top of the fact that it's an incredible opportunity. Like you got to keep working because in this industry, if you become irrelevant, it's a hard path back. You always have to have something like cooking in the oven, you know? Oh, there's 400, there's 400 guys or gals right behind you waiting in the wings to take over what you left, whatever you left behind. Oh, no. When you were coming up, it's a little bit different. It, yeah. There wasn't as much competition. Definitely when I was coming up, it wasn't as much competition, but now. Yeah. Oof, Lord, yeah. Man. Because you can, you, I mean, the, the, you know, the, this camera 
looks incredible now. You can even do that fake depth of field thing too. So it's like, man, you it's know? insane. It's pretty yeah. insane. <laughs> it, it it's, is. Can you imagine if we had this kind of technology when we were yeah. coming up as kids, man? Well, especially with music videos too, you know? Oh, yeah, but, 500, and, that's an extravagant budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's funny that this kind of like, this has been a problem sometimes because like my, my choreographers will film dance and they'll, they they're also directors too and they like to kind of test out what kind of camera moves could work with the dance but they're using this and when we get on set i'm like well we can't move that fast it's this big steady camera it's a dolly or you know whatever so it's like a lot of times you know you have to like slow down when you're when you're rehearsing things but uh but yeah yeah it was you know it was also just like what a big opportunity and I just couldn't pass it up, you know, and, and I love, and I love Brian and Nickelodeon's great too. Um, my, my, my partner, Nikki Lopez works for Nickelodeon too. We just happen to both have projects at Nickelodeon. So um, it's, it's definitely a good family there for sure. Hey, listen, one of my first jobs was working in Orlando, Florida, Nickelodeon studios. Oh, you were at the OG. That's cool. I, I was the, Oh, I, I, I just saw Brian many times walking behind oh, no. on set. Yeah. Cause he was producing stuff back then. He was doing all that. And, and yeah. All that, I, I to sort of for a, a for um trivia that no one cares about one of my first pa gigs was global guts oh nice that? i was oh. on i was a spanish translator oh, in global awesome. in global guts so they would bring in like the, the the spaniards and the south american kids and i would be the one translating for them and i was on set there and there's oh it was it was amazing yeah. Yeah, Craig. They had the global guts was the glowing arrow, Craig, right? It was like a right. It, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a little bit different. I never did I never did guts. I did the global guts. So it was just always the international kids coming in. Yeah. And man, it was so much fun. I mean, that was I mean, we're talking what 96? Yeah. Yeah. In the in the heyday. So I remember seeing Brian and I remember seeing Brian, you know, on head of the class when he was coming yeah, up yeah. back back yeah. back back in the day. Uh yeah. no, I I I watched his career, man, and and He's pretty. He's a pretty remarkable dude. Like he yeah. really hustled up to the point where now he's running the studio. Yeah. Got to give it yeah. to him, man. Yeah, he's- no, and 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 everything Nickelodeon did in the '90s was so cool. I mean, it still it still is like a really cool like company that takes a lot of chances. But I was defined by that. You know, this the Ren and Stimpy slime, like Nick Magazine, like all that. It was so different than Disney. You know, because there was there was Disney and there was Nick and us Nick kids grew up a little weirder, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah, I would agree with you on that. Fred and know? Stimpy would do that to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 All that. yeah so. so, so when you, this is something I've always, I, I love asking a director who does musical, man, I've never done a musical scene. I mean, I've done music videos, but that's different. Yeah. I'm talking like a musical scene. Hey, I'm just going to bust out into song. We're going to mm-hmm. start dancing in the middle of central park. How the hell do you approach something like that? And let alone with CG characters on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the 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 mentality of the music video is still there. You know, like there is still, but I think the most important thing, the, the biggest difference is transitioning into it. You know, because you, I mean, obviously in the old MGM musicals, they'd just be talking and then boom, and then they'd start singing. <laughs> but I think like nowadays, you kind of have to justify, you know, like the MGM musicals, it was always, they're putting on a show, you know, so that's where the musicals came from. And then, you know, but, but some musicals like, like uh, um, the umbrellas of, of was it Sherberg? I can never say Mm -hmm. that word. They were just singing the whole time, kind of for no reason, you know, it just was a musical, you know? So our, this film was kind of that same thing where Josh is auditioning Broadway is the flavor, but our justification of the musical was always the sounds of New York, the things happening around you that sort of create a soundtrack if you really listen. So the build up to all the numbers was really important on this one. So that's why that transition into the first musical number, he's like, it's all chaos and there's cars honking and people, you know, cars squealing and people yelling out hot dogs, pretzels and all this stuff. And then he kind of slows down and closes his eyes and you hear his heartbeat. You start hearing like, Oh, like the taxi cabs are honking in rhythm and the bucket drummers are playing in rhythm. So using the sounds of New York, that was how we got in and out of these musical numbers. And that was the thing you have to think of. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't, you know, if you just start singing and dancing, like that's fine, but it's so much cooler if you like kind of transition into it and sort of justify what you're seeing on screen is, is a story element. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and and the other, the other difference is kind of, um, you know, when you kind of cut the dialogue too, and, and the timing of everything, you know, I mean, 
it's that that's an interesting too, thing too because you have to like have a metronome going um you know and like practice the dialogue because if you're recording dialogue like you can't have playback going so you have to really rehearse all the dialogue that is in between two sections and we were doing a lot like the songs that we that we did playback on set are nothing like the songs we ended up with and i remember like we we shot this one section twice that josh did and we liked them so much we just doubled up the chorus in post-production and just like made it longer because he danced really good from these two different angles you know so there was a lot of frankensteining in post too and that like drove you know steph fink my incredible she produced all the music and, and wrote one of the songs happiness is magic and i mean our post-production was insane and I definitely drove her crazy, but she was such a trooper and we changed the song so many times after the fact, but you know, it's, it's a lot of, um, you know, you fall in love with shots and you just got to use them all. So you change the song to like use all the visuals. <laughs> but yeah, I think the transitions is the biggest difference because in a music video, you just start and the song plays, you know what I mean? Sure. Like, it's all on the list, so. Now there's another aspect to this film that was really interesting. It's the Spider-Man no way home effect That's where, true all of the hosts from all generations came in through the multiverse. No, I'm joking, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all come in. That was as probably a big of a deal to blues clues fans as watching Spider-Man no way home for you. And I, when we saw that, we're like, Oh my God, that's Toby. Yeah. Holy yeah. Cow, that's Andrew. And they're all together. Yeah. And like, I'm like, I get chills when I talk about this because I'm such a geek. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just like, you know, you start like tearing up. You're like, oh, my God, I remember when I saw Toby as Spider-Man. So I imagine the same thing happened with the Blue's Clues people. Like, I'm sure the, the parents were like, oh, my God, there he is. There's Josh. And there's, yeah. you know, this. So how what was when you guys when you read the script and all that? How was that whole thing bringing that all together as a director? I mean, I thought it was cool when I first read the script, but I didn't I didn't realize the impact because I didn't grow up with Steve. I was, you know, Steve came out and I was a little bit too old. So it was more like one of those things when after the fact, you know, like not, not after we were shooting, but after I got on the project and he did the whole viral thing and talked to the camera, I realized like it actually makes sense. He was such a, I mean, it, Blue's Clues was the first time, you know, the character looked at the camera, talked to it, gave the kids time to react and talk back. It was this interactive TV show thing. It was pretty revolutionary. And he meant a lot to a lot of kids, you know, and they're all 25, 30 now. And you know, just what you look online and all the comments and when I repost something, I mean, people were like, yo, you helped me get through this. You helped me deal with anxiety. You know, you, you just like, you shaped my life when I was like, when I was an outcast and I just went and watched Blue's Clues and felt like somebody was listening to me. And, and it's, I, I didn't realize how, how much of a responsibility it was to both myself and even him performing in the movie, you know, how many people love that guy and, and putting them all together. Um, I mean, I, I, by the time we were shooting, I was like, yeah, this is important because there's all the rules of blues clues, you know, like you have to make sure you talk to the camera at eye level. You don't look down at a kid. You don't look up at a kid. You know, you're talking on their level. And Steve was teaching me a lot of that stuff, too, um, you know, before we were shooting because he directed a bunch of blues clues as well. And, um, you know, seeing them all together, it, it's it's it is that thing, you know, because I mean, in the theater, when Spider-Man happened, I mean, people were throwing popcorn in the air. It's like oh. screaming. You couldn't oh. even hear because people were screaming you know and everyone knew it was coming <laughs> right I, you know it, it it had to come I mean, my girlfriend and i wanted miles miles to be in there somehow too but maybe that'll happen ne next yeah. next time next time come on yeah. don't get greedy don't get greedy yeah, i know i know you're right, you're right. <laughs> we got the spider uh, but it's a spider verse okay come on yeah. <laughs> yeah. but but you know like with this one too you know it's coming but we really paid attention to like building up their intros and when the first time you see them and even like the comedy because they're all so they're also different. Yeah, they all were hosts, but their their sense of humor is in the fact that like, you know, Joe is still wearing a stupid purple pink shirt, you know, and he runs a present store, but the rent is high and he makes a joke about that, you know, and the fact that Steve is this bumbly detective that has this great heart, but, you know, he needs a, a piece of a, a bar of soap to help him, you know, find clues and stuff like it's it's just so funny and 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 ridiculous, you know, and and it's so heartwarming. I mean, these guys are incredible. The The show is incredible. And it was great to be a part of that and see it all happen. And, and again, it was something where I read the script. I was like, this is cool. But then once you sit down and work with them and see them all on set, you're like, this is, this is a big deal. It's like 25 years in the making. So um, I was glad to sort of lend, you know, my, my point of view, you know, to that whole process. 
Now, when is it coming out and where can people see it? It's uh, November 18th on Paramount Plus. And, uh, you know, I don't know if there's going to be Rocky Horror, you know, midnight showings of it, but I think a lot of the, uh, <laughs> fingers crossed that happens because there's a lot of silly stuff in the movie that you could, you could throw a pretzel at the screen or you could like, you know, toss salt over your shoulder or whatever. I, I feel like there's a lot of that fun stuff, but, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's November 18th. And I think uh, internationally it's like November 19th and then it's going to come out of some other, some other countries in December, but uh, yeah, Paramount Plus. I mean, if the whole thing goes to hell, man, with your career, at least you know in 20 years you'll go to a convention. You can still sign some autographs. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah. mean, I mean, you're good. You're set, bro. Yes, I will. I will get those <laughs> residual autograph, whatever you know, signing the little Funko doll that Steve came out with. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> now no, I'm gonna ask you a few. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Uh, I'd say write and conceptualize what you know. You know, just if you if you're obsessed with Christmas, make a Christmas movie. If you grew up in um, if you grew up in Chicago, make a movie about Chicago. If you know a certain neighborhood there, write about that. If it's your cultural background and you're and you're really invested in that, just write what you know, because when you pitch in a room and you know more than the executives about something, you know, um, they will genuinely want to hear that story. You know, if you make a movie about something know about you know it, it shows you know so if you know something front and back like you can be the guy you have to be the only person that can make that movie good that's actually really good advice um what lesson would what lesson took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life oh my gosh so we got <laughs> more hours left on this thing uh, <laughs> now it's um um it's it's never worth it i think i think on set it's never worth it to do anything that isn't safe you know there's always those right. oppor- there's all those there's those mm-hmm. moments where like obviously an a like there's so many people on set that don't want you to do unsafe stuff but you can sense when you're pushing something a little too much when a crew member is pushed a little too much when an actor is pushed too much it's just never worth it like find a different solution because you don't want someone being too tired when they're driving home you don't want an actor to lose your respect you don't want someone getting hurt it's like it's just not worth it. Don't take chances with safety. Yeah, and and I've had too many stunt guys come up to me. I'm like, I could I could be on fire. I'm like, I don't need you. Yeah, to be on exactly. Fire. You're right. You need yeah. to. You need to. All you need to. They're oh, have you ever met a stunt guy who didn't do that? All of them do it. Every they, because it's like, hey, we're just suspending this guy from wires, but they want the explosions, you know. So it's always like, oh, yeah. oh I need yeah. you to jump ten feet. I could do it sixty feet, and yeah. I could be on fire. Yeah, while yeah. there's a tiger chasing me. I'm like, dude, I don't yeah. need no. You need. To yeah. relax. Every yeah. single stunt guy I've ever met always. Yeah. Does. Oh my god, I love stunt people. I know they're the they're the craziest. They are the craziest carnies in our carnival. I mean, they yeah. are nuts. Yes. They the are best. in the best, best wonderful, wonderful, loving way. They are absolutely nuts, and they make our films so much better. <laughs> yeah. And um, last question: three of your favorite films of all time. Okay, uh, number one is going to be Eight and a Half, Fellini. I'm obsessed with it. The whole thing feels like a dream, and it feels like looking at my own childhood, even though it's a totally different culture, you know? Um, number two would be Natural Born Killers. That thing just breaks so many rules, and it's just oh, like yeah. all the all the formats they shot on, how they shot it, and it's this like awesome like Badlands love story, but updated, and it's so 90s, and it's I, I love that movie. Um, and then... Uh, Man, number three has got to be Clockwork Orange. It's just I mean, the, the, I mean, I mean, Kubrick, I mean, every one of his movies can be in anyone's top 10. He was a director that made like the best horror movie of all time, the best war film of all time. I mean, arguably, you know, the best drama of all time, the best comedy. But uh, Clockwork Orange just, I mean, it was my, it, it has roots in my punk rock, like high school upbringing. And that's just the movie we watched on repeat a million times. Can you imagine releasing the first 20 minutes of clockwork orange in today's world i mean and how the, yeah. how could they even do it then and i'm watching yeah. i just watched it recently again i'm like this stuff is still so far gone so far out yeah that you yeah. could not release it can you imagine if a major studio released this today yeah it, it's crazy too because everything that's like based <laughs> off book is really obscene and dirty and profane. You know, books are always the dirtiest thing ever. You know, it doesn't matter how old it is. Like you could like, you read an old Henry Miller book, you're like, whoa, you know, but you know, that's where all the good movies come from is great books. You know, a lot of them do. And so it's, 
the uh, the obscene will always be there, and let's hope the studios keep releasing it because <laughs> they're the fun ones. <laughs> Matt, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Continued success and congratulations on all the success you had. And and uh, thank you for bringing Blues Clues uh, to the new generation and bringing all of them together, man. It's, it's a lot of fun, man. So I appreciate yeah. you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you, Alex, for sure. Man.